All right. Oh. All right. Hey, guys and girls. Hello, hello. Welcome. It is Wednesday night. We are going to be doing our real estate school coaching call. Sorry, I'm a couple minutes late. Got caught in a little traffic. Give me just one second here to get organized. Okay, okay, okay. Hopefully everybody's having a good night thus far. Can you guys hear me okay? Make sure everybody can hear me before I jump on in. Yep. Cool. Okay, let's see. Tonight we are talking about, looks like I had a poll going. Where did my, my pen post go? Uh, here it is. All right. Looks like, ooh, we had a tie. Marketing lists and leads versus systems and processes. Well, we can cover a little bit of both of those, actually. There's really um, no, no, no problem doing that. So, um welcome 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 we got Kristen, we got nikita we got marjorie i'd imagine we'll have a few more jumping on as well let's jump on into marketing lists and leads and then we can kind of wrap it up with some systems and processes if anybody has any questions please feel free to just interrupt or ask you don't need to wait till the end especially when we don't have you know super big groups on uh, more than happy to just have a conversation with y'all at any at any point in time here. So first and foremost, this is the marketing business, guys and girls. If you are a real estate investor, wholesaler, fix and flipper, landlord, you name it, you need to understand that you are in the marketing business before you are in the house flipping business, okay? The house flipping business the landlord business the wholesale business are great businesses but if you don't have any houses to buy if you don't have any sellers that are motivated it's going to be very difficult to get good deals on property can you find good deals on the mls yeah kind of but it's going to be much 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 harder can you find good deals going through wholesalers yeah you can you know i buy 20 ish percent of my deals through wholesalers but you're going to be limited to, you know, 20% of the deals that you could be doing if you were doing your own marketing. All right. So marketing is the name of the game when it comes to real estate investing, specifically wholesaling. If you are a wholesaler, it's going to be very, very difficult to wholesale deals off the MLS. It's possible. Don't get me wrong. It's a, It ain't easy though. All right. When direct to seller marketing for wholesaling is going to be much, much, much easier. So marketing is the name of the game. There's lots and lots and lots of different ways to do marketing. Marketing, let's talk about marketing for a second. Marketing is nothing more than a fancy word for getting people on the phone. That's all it is. Marketing just means getting people on the phone. Either you call them or they call you. There's lots of different ways that we can call people and find them, market to them. There's even more ways in which we can do some sort of marketing or advertising, I should say advertising, to get them to call us, all right? So I looked at, I look at marketing uh, in, in terms of kind of two different ways we can do marketing. We can hunt or we can fish, all right? And another good way to kind of break this down is, um, is time versus money, all right? There's, you can look at it both ways. So you can spend a lot of time driving around, knocking on doors, cold calling. That works. We do that. I do that. Or you can spend money to get a message put out into the world some, somewhere, somehow, uh, be an advertisement, a billboard, could be a radio ad, could be a television ad, could be a bandit sign, 
could be a Facebook ad, could be a Google ad, could be you posting on social media, could be you networking and handing out business cards. All of these things are going to essentially represent you and advertise you as somebody who can solve a problem or provide a solution to another. And they're either going to go to your website and fill out a form, they're going to send you an email, they're going to call you, or they're going to text you. That's really it. All right. So those methods are going to be when you spend money to get your phone to ring. If you don't have a lot of money, that's okay. We can still uh, do lots of deals without having lots of money, but we're going to need to spend time in order to get those people on the phone. So what's a lead? All right, we're talking about marketing lists and leads. Brian, you're welcome, welcome, welcome. Thanks for joining us. Marketing is nothing more than a fancy word for getting people on the phone, doing something to get them on the phone. What is a lead? A lead is, is nothing more than somebody who you can contact. That's all that is. A lead is somebody who you can contact. Marketing is the act of doing something to get somebody on the phone. All right. So lots of different ways to do the marketing. We talked about spending time. We talked about spending money. I also like to look at it like you're either hunting or you're fishing. They, they kind of go in line with time and money in a way. Um, when you're hunting, you're out. You're on foot, right? They think about you out deer hunting, for example. I've never been deer hunting, but we all know what deer hunting is, right? You're out in the woods. You're either up in a tree or you're on foot and you're just walking around. Maybe you have a bow and arrow. Maybe you have a gun. And you're trying to find yourself a deer. When you find that deer, you got to shoot and kill it. Well, that's kind of similar to cold calling or door knocking um, or going to networking events and meeting people. Like you're out, you're, you're spending time trying to find those deer or motivated sellers in this case. Fishing is really more so correlated with spending money, right? Hunting is free. But it does cost time. It's free on the capital side, but it costs time. Fishing, all right, doesn't require a whole lot of time, but it does require capital. So here's a great example I like to use when I'm talking about fishing. You and me, we each go to a lake to do some fishing. You bring your new shiny, fancy rod and reel. It's, and you got a bunch of great lures and a big old bobber and a cooler, and you're having a, the, a good time. And you cast your line in the water. And then you're just sitting there whistling, waiting. Well, I also go to that, that same lake, and I don't have a fancy rod or reel, but I got 70 rods and reels. And I cast 70 of them out in the water. So you have one bobber floating, and I have 70. And all of a sudden, bobbers start going. We're getting bites. And I just start reeling all mine in. Well, you maybe will get one too. But in the time that you're going to get one, I'm going to get six or eight or ten with my 70. And the whole purpose of this, of this metaphor, this scenario here, is when you're spending money on marketing, you can do a lot more of it. I can only knock on one door at, the, at a time. I can only make one call at a time, unless I'm using a multi-line dialer, but I can really only talk to one person, even though I may be able to dial three or four or five people at the same time. I can really only talk to one person at a time. Well, I can send 10,000 mail pieces today, and it may take three or four days to arrive in mailboxes, but I can send all 10,000 of them today. I could go spend $1,000 tomorrow on a billboard that is up for two months and have 300,000 people drive by that billboard. So it's time or money when it comes to marketing. Hunting or fishing, they kind of correlate. Hunting's more of a time activity. Fishing is more of a, a capital intensive money spending activity, but they both are gonna do the same thing. They're gonna advertise your business, AKA marketing allows you to get people on the phone who become leads. Leads are people you can contact. Let's not overcomplicate that. Does anybody have any questions about this, about that thus far? Ooh, I'm parched. I just sat in the sauna. Okay, so kind of covered marketing and the leads. Let's talk about lists. 
there are tons and tons and tons of lists that we can use to market. We can cold call them. We can mail them. We can email them. We can text them. We can look them up and, and DM them on social media. We can do any lots of different things to basically advertise our business to them. Um, Mike and I, my partner Mike and I, have done lots and lots of deals. 70% of the deals that we have done in our life have come from two lists. Vacants and absentees. Two lists. Vacants and absentees. All right. Now, there's 10, 12, 15 lists that we're constantly marketing to. But your vacants and your absentees. That's hilarious. My cat's going crazy because I locked him out and my wife just gave him some milk. I can hear the... <laughs> so he just ran up the steps going for that milk. Sorry. Uh, vacants and absentees was where I was at. Those are the low-hanging fruit. We 70% of all the deals that I've ever done and continue to do week in and week out, 70% of them are either a vacant home or an absentee-owned home. Right, and I see your chat. That's too funny, isn't it? Um, all of my oldest son's baseball games. Sorry, no video. Okay, yeah, no problem, man. I'm glad you're uh, hanging out with your kids, man. I'm glad you're here too, though. Awesome. So, um, vacants and absentees are the low-hanging fruit. We market to vacants and absentees every month. And if it's not every month, then it's every six weeks. But every four to six weeks, on average, I'm going to pull a list of vacants. I'm going to pull a list of absentees. Those are two separate lists. Now, keep in mind, you may have a good number of people that are on both of those lists. What is it called? The Venn diagram, I believe it is, where you have the two circles that overlap. You're going to have a decent amount of people that are going to be on each list. But when you're going to pull your list, don't pull vacants and absentees as one list because you're only going to get that little sliver in the middle. Instead, pull a vacant list, clear your, 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 your filters, and then pull an absentee list. Those are two separate lists. If you end up marketing to several people that are on both lists twice, that's a good thing in my eyes. It's more opportunity for you to get in front of them and let them know that you are interested in buying properties and they may have one that they want to sell. Hopefully they do. And you can be the person to help them sell it. You can solve the problem for them. So vacants and absentees, folks, I cannot stress this enough. Vacants and absentees are going to be your low hanging fruit. Where do you find vacant and absentee lists? Well, I love using Deal Machine, Batch Leads, and PropStream. Those are probably my three favorite tools. Um, over in Real Estate School, we have free trial links for you all if you want to test those out. Deal Machine actually in includes skip tracing. Skip tracing is free. All of the leads that you get inside of Deal Machine come skip trace. So you don't need to spend extra money or go to a third-party site to go get their contact information, phone numbers, and emails. PropStream and Batch Leads, they skip trace in those sites, but you're going to have to pay an additional fee to do that. I use all three. You definitely do not need to go use all three. I have all three uh, for a, a various amount of reasons, but mostly because I'm teaching and coaching people that use different platforms. And it just makes sense for me to be able to help them within the platform that they're using. Ah, parched. Okay, so what other kind of lists can we work with? Do me a favor. Drop some, some notes in the comments here if you guys um, can. Um, I want to see what other kind of lists you all would think would make for good lists. And then we can review. Have you ever used real flow or lead flow? Um, I have. It's been several years, Brian. Um, it's a good platform. I know the owners. They're good guys. 
Um, I I have used it. It's been a long time, so I'm not very current. And I would say like pre-COVID, so it's been probably four years at least since I messed around with it. But that's a great platform. So that can be a one. Uh, but that's more of a platform than it would be a list per se. But yeah, good question. Okay, some other lists. Let's just jump in here because I know there's going to be people that are going to watch this replay and I don't want to keep them waiting here. So other lists that I really like are Tired Landlords. I also like um, Probates. Probates can be really good. Um, I like Pre Foreclosures. I like High Equity. I like Seniors. I like tax delinquent. Expired listings is a list that we maybe will pull once or twice a year. I don't love that list, but that is a list. Um, let's see, what else is there? I said pre-foreclosure, there's probate, there's inherited properties. Um, and then, and I mentioned tax delinquent. That's really the main ones. You, there's a lot of other niche lists. Like you could go to your local county and, and or even um, your county and get like a code enforcement list. You might even need to go directly to the municipality level to get the code enforcement list. You can also use the Sunshine Request forms to send a Sunshine Request over to the water company to get water shutoff lists. I've done these both in the past. I don't love these methods because they don't send you an Excel file. You can you can go up to the city, county, municipality, water company, whatever it may be, and they're just gonna just hand you a printout. Well then, yeah, you got these leads, but you have to skip trace them. Well, in order to skip trace them, you need to get them into an Excel sheet. So there's just, you're gonna either need to spend hours and hours and hours typing all this data in, Maybe you can scan it in, use a tool, or you can hire somebody, virtual assistant or local assistant or some, something like that to help you get this into an Excel sheet. To me, it's always just kind of been more work than it's worth. Maybe nowadays with all this AI, there's, there's an easier way to do that. But I want to circle back to something here. 70% of all the deals in, in, that I've ever bought and continue to buy have been vacant and absentee. And those, oddly enough, are the two easiest lists to get and to pull. So at the end of the day, you're not going to find me personally up at the local water company with the sunshine request trying to get those leads and jumping through all these hoops when I can just easily, from my laptop anywhere in the world, pull a list of vacants and absentees and start marketing to those people. So for you all here today and anybody watching this replay, I would highly recommend and suggest you start with the simple, the easy button. Start with, you know, where most motivation comes from. Behind vacants and absentees, I would say tax delinquent, tired landlord, and probate are probably going to be the next three that I'm going to go to. All right. And oftentimes I'll just cycle through those five lists. Vacant and absentee, tax delinquent, probate, and tired landlord. That's it. Those are the five that I'm going to essentially spend 90 to 95% of my efforts on. Now, I don't want to undermine, or I almost forgot, but I don't want to undermine building your own list of leads either. Those, in fact, can be some of the best leads. Now, some of you may be thinking, and if you're not, that's okay, but I'm going to plant a seed. If vacant and absentee are going to be the low-hanging fruit, won't most investors be marketing to those lists? Yes, that is true. Those are probably going to be the, the most highly uh, marketed to lists, okay? However, don't let that stop you because most people aren't going to follow through. All right, I can't tell you how many times I've got a letter in the mail for somebody wanting to buy one of my houses and I will call the number on the letter, leave a message and never hear back. It's 
somebody just spent 60 cents to mail me a postcard or a letter. I call them, not because I want to sell my property, but because I want to talk to them about buying properties from them because they're doing marketing. I don't tell them that on my voicemail. I just say, hey, I'm Dave. I got a, I got a property I may be interested in selling. You give me a call back. Here's my number. And I never get a call back. So just because a lot of people are marketing to these lists doesn't necessarily mean that it's not worth your time or my time. In fact, that's what I spend the majority of my time doing is marketing to vacants and motive vacants and absentee owned property. So for all of you here that are maybe wondering, maybe you all already know this, and that would be great if you do, but just in case, what's a vacant property? A vacant property is a property that has been marked uh, vacant by the United States Postal Service. Just because somebody doesn't live in it doesn't really necessarily make it hit the vacant list. Is a home that nobody lives in vacant? Yeah, in theory it is. But is it on the United States Postal Service's vacant list? That depends. The only people that can essentially put a home on the vacant list is a postal worker. But if you think about this, you have an army of postal workers that basically touch every door in the United States every day, almost. Of course, that's not exact. There's not every door touched every day, a lot of rural homes. But for the most part, in all the major metros, a mail carrier goes to a home every day. If a mail carrier has a bunch of mail stacking up in the mailbox, after two or three weeks, they are going to mark that property as vacant within their system. So mail will get returned to sender or be forwarded so they're not having to deal with all that mail piling up at the home. So when we pull a vacant list from deal machine, prop stream, batch leads, whatever it may be, maybe you're going elsewhere, maybe it's really slow, whatever. They are all pulling that list from the United States Postal Service. That's where that data comes from. Okay. So a vacant list comes from USPS. Can a home be vacant and not on the list? Absolutely. But for the most part, these mail carriers are pretty smart because they don't want to have to go do extra work. They're actually doing themselves a favor by marking that property vacant, but they're also helping all of us real estate investors out and doing us a favor because then it gets added to the list. So we can then mark it to the list. If we send mail to a vacant list and it comes back, then we need to go a step, a step deeper and skip trace the people that we're mailing to and try to find alternate mailing addresses or just phone numbers that we can call and text or emails that we can send emails to. Mail that comes back, like I was saying earlier, is actually a good thing because a lot of investors are lazy and they will actually just throw that mail away and move on. We never throw away mail that comes back. We stack it up. In fact, it's all the way across my room, so I'm not going to have to go up and grab it. I got a stack of mail this big on my desk across the room. This this much mail. This is probably just in like the last maybe three or four months. And I don't call them the day it comes back. I usually let it stack up a little bit. I bring it into the office. My, my partner, Mike, and I and our assistant, we sit down for four or five hours, and we just start going through them, and we just try to find them and locate them and use different websites to get their phone number and just start making calls. And usually when I have a stack this big, I can get four or five people on the phone that want to sell me their home. So that mail that comes back is really, really valuable. Don't throw it away. Okay? If anybody has any questions, speak up, comment, unmute. I'm here to help. This is real estate school. Happy to help. Okay. Next point. Absentees. What is an absentee owner? Or an absent? How does somebody get on the absentee list? I do have a question on your methods of researching to find them in their return mail. Indeed. Okay, so great, great question. So usually we'll start with Deal Machine because Deal Machine includes all of the skip tracing. If I can't find their, sorry, if I can't find their info from Deal Machine, um, I will pull it up in batch leads and skip trace it in batch leads. Usually, I'm, you know, I might get a little bit different data when I do that. Not always. Sometimes it's the same. 
Uh, but batch leads is, you know, it's like 10 or 12 cents. So like it's worth spending the 10 or 12 cents to see if there's any different data in there. Um, outside of that, I'm going to use true people search. Now, deal machine will actually allow you to do a semi deep skip. Now, what's a deep skip? A deep skip is when you um, skip trace the property owner, but you're also looking for relatives. So with Deal Machine, you can sometimes find tenants, you can sometimes find like spouses or very, very close relatives, but it doesn't do a super deep skip. It may only go one or two layers of, you know, above and beyond the actual owner. Well, if you use the website truepeoplesearch.com, it's going to be manual. It's going to take you a little bit of time, a couple minutes, you know, not a crazy amount of time. But you can do a super deep skip trace, which essentially means it will show you all known family members um, and business partners, Not obviously not their friends, because that's going to be an impossible thing for anybody to know. But like, for example, if you were to do a deep skip trace on me, you would find my wife, you would find my cousins, you would find my sister, you'd probably find my parents, you'd probably find my aunts and uncles. You'd probably find my business partner, Mike, associated with me because we're on bank loans together. Um, and you'd probably find my best, my good and best, my good friend, Justin, um, who lives in Columbia, who I own rentals with. You'd probably find all those names, all those people that are associated with me somehow, some way. So if you weren't able to get a hold of me, you could go down the list. You could call my cousin, Chris, you could call my cousin, Brian, you could call my wife, you could call my aunt, Judy. You could call my business partner, Mike. You could call my business partner, Justin. You could call my uh, my sister, Danielle. And you could say, hey, I'm trying to locate David, the owner of uh, 218 North Floridale. Um, do you happen to know a good number I could reach him at? And they may say, David doesn't want to be reached. They may say, yeah, he just got a new number. Here it is. I'll give it to you. Or maybe they say he's incarcerated. Who knows what the answer is going to be? It's going to vary. It's going to depend. But if you can't get a hold of the property owner, then you need to do a deep skip and you need to find known contacts and relatives. Most of the time it's going to be, most of the time, it's going to be a spouse, a child of that person, a parent of that person, or a sibling of that person. But you can find lots of acquaintances. Like I bet if you put my name in there, there's probably somewhere between 20 and 30, if not more acquaintances associated with me. There's a huge list. So you're going to have to go and you're going to have to click on each one and pull up the numbers and start making calls. It's going to take time. But if you do that and nobody else does that, Kristen, and you can get me on the phone in this scenario and I'm motivated to sell, there's not a whole lot of competition. Most investors aren't going to go the extra mile to do that. So, Great question, simple answer. I start with Deal Machine. I'll often use batch leads. If I can't find their information that way, then I will go do a deep skip and I will use truepeoplesearch.com. That's a free tool. We also have access to a paid tool called TLO. It's expensive. I think we spend $175 a month on this tool, plus $1 per search. And that is through TransUnion. And quite honestly, I haven't even used that in damn near a year because I don't need to because True People Search has gotten so good in the last year that I don't need to even use it. We have it because we own a bunch of property and we do property manage a lot of our property. And whenever we're doing applications with people, we need to run credit and we need to do background checks. And that's the system that we use to do the to do that with. But we can also use that system to find people. It's expensive, though. I wouldn't recommend anybody go get it. And, it, and I, actually, if you're not a property manager or have a legitimate reason outside of just wanting to find people, you can't get it. Uh, I'm getting in the weeds here. Stick to truepeoplesearch.com. Um, it's free. Now, it's going to be a one-off, right? Each name you click is, is going to take you to that person's profile. But... I mean, it's rare that I can't locate somebody or at least figure out their whereabouts or find out if they're alive or dead or 
in the country or incarcerated or whatever by not by doing some deep digging, some deep skip tracing. I mean, maybe we'll spend five or ten minutes per mail. I mean, we're not spending hours, but I may call ten different people trying to locate Bill Nye if I can't get Bill Nye directly from his his contact information that's in the system. Great question. Okay, let's move on to absentee, vacant USPS lists. That's where that data comes from. Absentee lists, okay? Absentee lists come at the county level, all right? When you own real estate, you have to pay real estate taxes annually. The taxes are collected at the county level. The county has a database and it is a public database. In fact, you can type in typically Zillow, any property address, scroll down, usually not every single property, but usually Zillow will actually link you to that particular property's county website. If Zillow doesn't link it, then you just Google search and you can find it. But essentially every county, and I think there's, don't quote me on this, but I think there's like 2,600 counties nationwide. I could be way off, but there's a lot. There's at least a few thousand. Let's go with that. And each county has its own database of all the properties that are within that county, and they charge taxes. Those real estate taxes typically fund the schools. They can also fund the roads and the fire department and the police and lots of other things, not all of them, but they can. It's mostly the schools though. When a county has a property in it and they send a tax bill to the property owner that lives at that home, that is considered non-absentee. An owner-occupied home like me right now in the home I'm in, I'm in my basement. When I get a tax bill from the county, they say, okay, David Dodge owns this home and he lives at this home. So we're just going to send the bill to his home. Non-owner occupied. I'm sorry, occupied, non-absentee. Absentee means where the tax, it simply means this, the tax bill does not get sent directly to the property address. It gets sent to an alternate address. So for example, I own right now, approximately 47 single family homes. Not a single tax bill from those 47 homes gets mailed to those homes. They all get mailed to my office. So I essentially own 47 absentee homes because the tax bills don't get sent to the property itself. They get sent to a third party address. So the definition of absentee is so simple. It just means the tax bill does not get sent to the property that the taxes are due for. That's it. So typically speaking, an absentee owned home is a landlord, right? Or it's somebody who has moved out of the property and has probably some motivation, at least a little, and probably needs to sell it. That's why we love marketing to our vacants and our absentee lists. Brian says the United States has a total of 3143 counties of county or county equivalent. Wow, I was I was off by about 50%, but that's okay. I knew it was several thousand. Thank you, Brian. Uh, which include parishes in Louisiana and boroughs in Alaska. This number encompasses all the primary administrative divisions in the United States across the 50 states. I knew it was several thousand. I love that, Brian. Thank you for, for adding that. That's actually really valuable to me. 3,143, let's just round it up to 3,150. It's about 3,150-ish counties. Each one of those collects taxes. You got county tax, you got state tax, you got federal tax, and then you also got income, or you, and then you also have sales tax. I mean, there's all these taxes, they're everywhere. But what we're talking about specifically is the real estate tax. It's typically an annual tax due um in december or in january the bills usually go out i believe the bills go out december 1st 
they're due by December 31st, or maybe they give you an extra month until January 1st. I honestly don't know, but I know that I probably pay 80 grand a year in property tax. It's crazy. Maybe even close to a hundred. It's a lot. So vacant USPS absentee it's done at the county level. And it essentially just means, hey, does the tax bill get sent to the property that we're taxing or does it get somewhere else? That's it. Let's not overcomplicate these two things. All right. So let's recap here. We're 40 minutes into the call. Marketing. Fancy word for getting people on the phone. Don't overcomplicate this. Leads. Somebody you can contact. Don't overcomplicate this. Lists. Oh, I, I kind of brushed over driving for dollars. Use Deal Machine, Batch Leads, Prop Stream, Resimply, probably really flow, real flow. Get the East silent there. And there's probably 20 other apps, applications at this point that you can help you drive for dollars. You don't even need an app. You can do it with the pen and paper. I don't recommend you do that, but that's something you could do as well too. Deal Machine is my personal favorite place to go to drive for dollars. It's the simplest. It's the easiest to use. It comes with phone numbers, and it's really the OG driving for dollars app. It's the oldest, and you know it's been around the longest. Let's put it that way. So if I was gonna, you know, tell you guys to to go drive for dollars, if you didn't already have it included in the CRM, go get Deal Machine. Um, again, look in the resources here on Real Estate School. We have a free trial link for, uh, yeah, there's a free trial link in there. I think they offer a seven day free trial. But driving for dollars can be some of the best lists because these properties are properties that you physically drive by and you see that they have some sort of distress situation going on. Maybe there's a tree leaning up against the house. Maybe there's a tarp on the roof. Maybe there's a broken down car in the driveway. Maybe they haven't cut their grass in two months. Maybe the gutter's hanging off the house. Maybe the paint's chipping. Maybe it's a missing siding. Maybe it's boarded up windows. Maybe it's got all those problems. Add that property to your list when you're driving for dollars. Generate a list. Send mail to that list or cold call that list. Brian asks, what CRM do you use? Does it sync with Deal Machine? It's a great question. I use Resimply. You can drive for dollars with Resimply, but I don't. I just use Deal Machine because I've been using it for eight years. Could I get rid of Deal Machine and just do it through Resimply? Yeah. But I don't want to do that because I just really like Deal Machine. And uh, my CRM doesn't include skip tracing. Deal Machine does. And I have lots of students that use it, and I want to be able to keep using it. I can also pull lists out of Deal Machine, too. My CRM doesn't allow me to pull lists. I can import lists, but I can't pull them out of Resimply. Resimply is the CRM that I use. It's fantastic. I love it. All right? I'm just... I like to do things a certain way. I'm sure everybody watching can relate. I've been using Resimply for maybe three and a half, four years. I've been using Deal Machine for eight. So for me, it just makes sense to just do what I know. That's not, you know what I'm saying? So great question. Um, great question. Okay. Deal Machine, any driving for dollars app for that matter, drive for dollars. I love driving for dollars. You're creating lists of physically distressed properties, number one. Number two, you are um, generating a list that isn't a list that can be purchased or pulled by the competition. I said earlier, my two favorite lists are vacants and absentees. I want to correct myself. Those are my two favorite lists behind a driving for dollars self-generated list. Reason is, is oftentimes whenever I'm driving for dollars, the, a lot of the properties that I'm adding, they are vacant and, and or absentee. And then they also have some physical sign of distress that I can see with my eyes as I'm driving by. All right. So the driving for dollars lists are going to be the best list because they're not going to be lists that you, you can't purchase a driving for dollars list unless you buy it from somebody who physically did it. It's, it's basically a self-made list. Now, you're going to have to spend time and money and gas or electricity if you have an electric car getting out there and doing it. I have a student who does it on foot and rides his bike up in New York. So, you know, you don't necessarily even need a car to do it. You could ride a bus. You could ride a bicycle. You could walk. You could go 
corporate job, but you're essentially just building a list on your own of physically distressed properties. All right. So that would be my absolute favorite list. In fact, I've done a six figure wholesale deal. I did a $103,000 deal one time from driving for dollars, found a property uh, for my driving for dollars, marketed to them with a postcard. It really wasn't a wholesale, it's more of a flip, but I didn't put any money into it. I bought the property for like three grand. I held it for about 18 to 20 months and sold it for $104,000. It was in a floodplain. I sold it to the municipality and FEMA funded it, oddly enough. 100, I got, I made 100 and 3,000, maybe I sold it for 107. I bought it for three. So 106 or 107 was what I ended up selling it for. Love driving for dollars. What's best or what's next behind that driving for dollars? Obviously my vacants and my absentees. I'm gonna pull my vacants and my absentees every four to six weeks over and over and over again. I am not gonna stop pulling these lists because these are the low hanging fruit. I've done a thousand deals, give or take, 70% of them are from one of these two lists. Even my driving for dollars leads are often also on my vacant or absentee lists. Not, not always, but often. So those are gonna be the ones that I'm gonna pull over and over again. And then every two or three months, give or take, I'm gonna go to the next set of lists, which would be my probate list, my tax delinquent list, and then my tired landlord lists. Now, one thing I didn't mention, and I don't think we're gonna have time to really get into systems and processes tonight, because I do wanna have a Q and A with you guys. But one thing I didn't mention, whenever I am pulling my list, this does not apply to driving for dollars typically. This only applies when I'm going online and I am pulling my lists. I have some things that I like to kind of refer to as my non-negotiables. I don't know why I call them that. I just, I've been calling them that since day one, but there's some th certain things that I don't really want to negotiate on in terms of the filters when I'm pulling my list. And those are essentially, I always want to be pulling uh, properties that are off the market. So I'm going to go into my filter, regardless of which system I'm going to use. Typically it's deal machine, batch leads, prop stream. And I'm going to make sure that it is an off market property. I want to filter out anything that is on the market. Brian says, when you pull your list, beds, baths, and square foot. Let me, I'm going to get to that in a second. So number one, I'm going to always, non-negotiable here, non-negotiable number one. I'm going to take out anything that is on the market active, gone. I don't want to deal with it. I don't want to deal with the agents. They've already have the mindset they're going to get full market value for it. It defeats the purpose of, of my marketing typically. So number one, I'm gonna, I'm gonna take that out. Number two, I don't want people that can't sell me their property at a discount. So I'm not gonna market to people that owe more than it's worth <clears throat> or even really owe at what it's worth. So what I'm gonna do is I'm going to essentially make sure that my list only shows 30 to 40 percent like that number kind of varies but for simple math let's just say a minimum of 30 30 is my minimum that i want to see in terms of equity so i'm going to go in and i'm going to say hey anybody that has less than 30 percent equity whoosh, take them off my list i don't even want to market to them i don't want to call them i don't want to send them a letter it's not worth my time because i'm typically buying properties at a minimum of a 30% discount. Usually it's closer to 50% discount. So I wanna take those people that have less than 30% out. So number one, non-negotiable, off market only. Anything that's on market, gotta go. Under 30% equity, gotta go, take it out. And then the third thing I like to often add in, and this is the third and final non-negotiable, um, is is going to it's going to depend on the area of the list i'm pulling but it's either going to be a one year minimum of ownership or it's going to be a minimum square foot sometimes i might even do both so that'd be number three and number four of my non-negotiables but i don't always do both usually what i just do to simplify this is i just say hey if they just bought this home less than 365 days ago or less than 12 months ago 
take it off my list because the odds of them being motivated to sell it at a 30, 40, 50% discount are just very low. Of all the properties that I bought in the last 19 years I've been in business, 10 years full time, like maybe two or 3% of them, they had just bought the home. Now, inheriting the home is a different story. So on my inheriting list, I'm not going to do that, right? But on the rest of these, vacant, absentee, tired landlord, by definition, they've owned it for 10 or 12 years already, uh, tax delinquent. In order to get tax delinquent, you have to own it for at least two or three years typically, right? I'm going to always take off any property that hasn't been purchased or owned, is a better word, for at least 12 months. Now, behind that, I may jump into some more things if my list is crazy big or I'm looking for certain properties like Brian had asked in the comments here. But let's recap just really briefly, really quickly on these non-negotiables. On market, got to go. So filter them out. Number two, 30% equity or greater. Anything less than that, take it off the list. And assuming it's not an inherited list and it's any of the other lists, a minimum of one year ownership. If it's less than that, take it off the list. So by doing this, you're going to cut the list down. It's not going to cut the list in half when you do that. It's usually going to take five, 10, maybe 15% of the leads out of it. But that's a good thing because those five to 15% of the leads you're taking out are worthless leads typically. The motivation amongst those leads isn't there or they physically can't sell you the property at a deal that you'd want to buy it at. So don't waste your time calling and texting and emailing those people and don't waste your money sending those people mailers. It's not worth it. All right. Now, beyond those non-negotiables, now I may pull a list in a particular area. Let's say it's an absentee list in St. Louis County where I live and operate and buy and invest. And I do my non-negotiables. I take out all the on-market properties. I take out 30% or less. And I remove anybody that hasn't owned it for a year. And I still have a really, really ginormous list. And I maybe want to send mail to this list. And it's like, oh, there's 12,000 people on that list. still. Ooh, that's a lot of mail. Then, Brian, then at that point, will I say, all right, cool. Let's take anything off that's less than 50 grand. Shrink my list down. Let's take anything off that's less than 800 square foot. Shrink the list down. Let's take anything off that's one bedroom house. So I, I only want two, two beds or greater. Remove that down. I also don't typically want to buy homes that are massive, right? They don't typically make for good rentals unless you're doing Airbnb. And I don't do a ton of Airbnb. I have a couple, but not very many. Um, so I might even, you know, make a range for my square footage. I might say, hey, take anything that's under 800 square foot out and take anything that's over 3,500 square foot out or maybe it's 4,000 out. I don't want to be marketing to homes that are 7,000 square foot. Now, it's not going to be that many of those homes, but they're just typically not going to make for good flips, rentals, or wholesales because they just don't typically. So lots and lots of different criteria that we can play with within these systems, specifically the three I named, batch, prop stream, and deal machine. If you're using other ones, I'm sure that there's simple and easy filters and ways to use those. I don't typically get too carried away with my filters. I mean, I've seen people online run, you know, pull lists and they got 20 care, 20 different filters. And to me, they're, they're filtering out too many possibilities of leads. I'd rather have a bigger list at the end of the day, but I also don't want to be foolish and market to people that aren't going to make for good opportunities. That's why I have my non-negotiables. So I think the three that I mentioned, let's cover them one more time, off market only, 30% or greater equity, and a minimum of one year ownership, excluding my inherited list, okay? It's gonna basically cut, cut out the majority of the people that aren't gonna have presumed motivation. So what do I mean when I say presumed motivation really quickly? I'm gonna jump into that for a second. Brian says, thank you, David. You're very welcome, Brian. Thank you for coming tonight. And thank you for being a part of real estate school, my friend. Um, 
When we go pull a list of vacants or absentees or probates or tired landlords or tax delinquents or even driving for dollars, whatever that list may look like, all right, not everybody on that list is going to be motivated. In fact, only about 2 or 3% on average will be, maybe 3 or 4%, right? But it's going to be a small number. But when, whenever I'm looking for somebody that can make a really good deal, that means that they are motivated to sell at a discount, which ultimately means that they are not capital motivated. They're convenient motivated. So there's really two types of motivation. When somebody says, yeah, I love to sell my house. I'm super motivated. And I say, oh, okay, great. And I look it up on Zillow and the property's worth 210000 and I say, great, what would you want for it? And they say, well, I'm not taking a dollar less than 225. Well, yeah, in theory, they're very motivated to sell that property, but not at a discount. They're not the kind of motivation I'm seeking. I'm seeking somebody that needs to sell, not somebody who wants to sell. They're both motivated people, all right? But what I'm looking for is people that are seeking convenience. They're looking for a cash offer that they can close with quick, not deal with a bunch of showings, not have to fix the property, not have to paint it, not have to clean it, not have to do any of these other things. And in exchange for all that convenience, they are more than happy to leave some money on the table and sell the property at a discount because that's the value that they're paying for, all right? So somebody could say, yeah, I'd love to sell my house today, but if they're not, willing to take a discount, that's not the right kind of motivation. A capital motivated person isn't somebody that I want to spend a lot of time wasting or talking to because that doesn't make for a good deal. Now, somebody that's needing convenience and they're willing to sell at a discount, ideally a big discount, that's somebody I want to bend over backwards for and make a friend with and build rapport and go run an appointment and make them an offer and see what else I can do to make their life easy in exchange for the value that they're gonna be providing me by selling that property to me at a discount. So hopefully that helps clarify a little bit. When I'm pulling my list, I'm looking for people that, are, that have a presumed motivation, let's take that one step further, for convenience. All right, I can't stand when people are like, oh, we're looking for motivated sellers. Well, anybody that wants to sell their home is motivated in theory. But you need to find people that need to sell or people that are motivated for the convenience that we can offer as wholesalers, fix and flippers, landlords, professional real estate investors. They need to be convenient motivated, not capital motivated. In fact, I'll sell my house right now. It appraised for about $850. i will happily sell it for a million bucks right now. That makes me a motivated seller. But I'm not the right kind of motivation, guys. You want somebody that's motivated for convenience, right? So what does that look like typically? Here's, here's the thing. Somebody that's typically motivated to sell at a discount and they are seeking that convenience, that typically looks like this. Death, divorce, disease, job relocation, uh, delinquent taxes. They're tired of being a landlord. Maybe they have a federal lien or a judgment. Uh, because they hadn't paid their taxes. Maybe the property is vacant and they can't afford to fix it up. <laughs> Maybe they live a couple states away and it was a rental and the tenants moved out and trashed it and they don't have the money to fix it up. That's an absentee owner. Maybe they have a tree that fell on the house and they can't afford to fix it. That could be a good driving for dollars lead. So you can see how these motivations kind of align, right? With the, with the types of lists that I'm pulling. Maybe they inherited the home and they don't want to deal with it, right? Um, I think that pretty much covers it. Vacant, absentee, tax delinquent, probate, which kind of encompasses inherited. That's a different list altogether, but it's, it's very similar. Um, and then tire landlords and then driving for dollars. Those are the main lists. Now there's probably 10 others. Honestly, I don't even waste my time with those other lists. I've done a thousand deals using the ones I just mentioned. I like to try to keep things simple. So if you guys want to go explore the other list, don't let me stop you, but it's probably going to be a very, very small percentage of the deals that you're going to do. Just stick to what works would be my advice. 
So, all right, 56 minutes in. I just did all the talking with the help of a couple comments. And I think, Kristen, thank you all for being here. This group is growing. I like seeing new faces and seeing people here. Uh, does anybody have any questions about marketing lists and leads? That's really the topic that we dove really head deep into tonight. Next week on Wednesday, we'll jump into systems and processes. Um, but let's just open it up for the for a little Q&A on the marketing list, the leads, or just anything else that anybody has any questions. If nobody does, then we can all just call it a night as well. Nikita, Nick, Marjorie, Brian, Kristen, and note taker. Anybody have anything? And if not, that's okay too. Brian says, great stuff. Thanks for being here, Brian. Hopefully the baseball game that you're watching for your son, hopefully he's winning and it's fun. That sounds like a good time. Hey, Nick, how are you, man? Is you doing good? I'm doing real well. Thank you. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. What do you think? We, we got any questions? I, I think I covered that pretty well tonight. Oh, yeah. You did a good job. Thank awesome. you. You're very welcome. You're very, very welcome. All right. Well, guys and girls, thank you for being here. We're going to be doing this every Wednesday. The group is growing. Invite your friends. Uh, if you have any questions between now and Wednesday on anything real estate related, use the community. We have a mobile app as well. So you can, you can, you know, log into real estate school from your mobile devices and phones. Um, really, really excited to start doing these weekly calls with you all and build this community. I'm having a lot of fun with it. Lots of good education in here. Um, I can't wait to start seeing people joint venture with each other and sell each other deals. I know this is, it's only going to keep growing and getting better over time. Uh, so again, thank you all for being here. And I guess that's a wrap. You guys have an awesome night. And, you know, again, make a post in school if you have any questions between now and next week. Enjoy your Labor Day weekend as well. That's this weekend. It's coming up. Came out of nowhere.